Coco, great to see you. And today I'd love to sort of pick your brains about, I guess, sequencing, because we've, we've obviously gone through the soft patch already, but people are really thinking about, OK, do we get a real recession and what does that look like? But before we go on to that, what I just want to sort of get uh, my head around, really, is that we've seen a, a historical move in most bond markets, quite, quite an astonishing move. And although we've seen a fairly big move down in equity markets, in some ways, equity markets have been relatively resilient considering the size of the move of the bond market. I mean, are you surprised at how resilient equities are? And why do you think that equities and bonds, although they've gone down together, the bond market move have been so much more incredible versus what we've seen in equities? Yes, thanks, Roger. And thanks for having me. This is actually a very interesting question because I think people remember the um, crash or the uh, equity bond correlation debacle in December of 2018, where you had uh, the Fed hiking rates and leading to a significant uh, collapse in equities. I think this time around, we have an inflation shock or inflation super spreader event. Um, and bonds are every, uh, obviously nominal assets. Um, and as central banks need to fight this inflation virus by raising rates, they bring down the price of bonds and push yield higher. However, equities have this interesting ability to pass inflation or cost push inflation, which is the, the problem we're dealing with with the energy crisis, through uh, pricing power. So uh, some equities with pricing powers have been able to raise their prices and essentially protect their margin. Um, and we call this greedflation. Uh, in other words, by being in a position of power, some of them have abused that position of, of power by raising prices up by more than what their input costs have increased by. Clearly, this might not be sustainable because ultimately demand destruction occurs, volume start to fall, and then profit margins start to fall. But for now, we are in this sort of tipping point where earnings are being resilient because companies are able to pass on that prices, and the increases in price, in the increase in price, is higher than the drop in volume, depending on sectors, uh, obviously. So timing is is everything, and therefore. And in that case, what are the sort of conditions that, that you, you would generally see in place or expect to see in place for there to be, potentially, if there is going to be one, a major low in the equity market? Is it that you know, we need to see more of a recession, more unemployment? What, what things would drive a real low, a real move, a real recessionary type, I guess, low in, in the equity market? Yeah, I mean, you need a proper demand destruction and collapse in, in, in demand. I mean, so far, what we've seen is a valuation uh, de-rating through higher bond yields, which brings down the uh, multiples like P multiples or price to book multiples. Uh, the next step of the uh, sequencing towards a, a slowdown or recession or uh, a significant fall in, in, in equities is really earnings. Uh, and for now, you have two things that are preventing this adjustment to be um, as brutal as it has been in the past. So number one, you have uh, significant cumulative excess savings. In the US, it's roughly two and a half trillion dollars, so roughly 10% of GDP, which is some of the consequences or, or benefit of the significant fiscal and uh, monetary stimulus uh, after COVID. So that's roughly 25 trillion dollars globally. And in Europe, you have roughly 7% of GDP in cumulative excess savings. So that's roughly 900 billion euros in, in sort of, you know, household bank account. Um, so you need a, a lot of tightening by central banks and this cost of living crisis for to eat into these savings and lead into significant uh, demand destruction. So it's a bit like we are in a crash in slow motion, if you will because of these two forces offsetting each other. Um, but as time goes by and the pressure increases uh, and sort of spending on you know, consumer discretionary start to drop, then you should start to see profit warnings um, like some of the auto sector, auto names we've seen uh, last week. Uh, and that ultimately will bring into, uh, uh, well, will trigger an earnings recession and, and more dramatic adjustment in, in equity prices. And one of the things that people have talked about in this so far is that we've had a slowdown, if we're looking more just the US, but we've had this slowdown, but we've not really seen a change in unemployment. In fact, when we look at the employment data, even if we assume that there is a bit of lagging and there might be revisions, it's still incredibly tight. In initial jobless claims have only just started ticking up. Unemployment is still towards historical lows. And often it's, it's unemployment, you know, which is an indication of a true recession, which is indication of the sort of redemption type activity that, that would occur in a, a true loan in the market. But so far, it hasn't really moved. 
what sort of things could change that or, or what do you see as the reason why we've had such a resilient employment market and what, what would be the catalyst for that to run over? Well, this is an excellent point, uh, Roger. And I think it's clearly a, a consequence of COVID. It was called the great resignation. So if you look at the labor market, there has been millions of jobs that um, have disappeared. And as a result, we have not only a supply demand um, distortion or imbalance in the goods and services industry because of supply chain disruptions, etc. There is a significant imbalance in the job market as well. Um, and as a result, you essentially have two job vacancies for every unemployed in the US. The ratio is roughly one to one in the UK, for example, and that's some of the consequences of, of Brexit. Uh, and in the US, you also have a, a drop in immigration. So if the supply of labor drops and the demand is, is pretty strong because of all the stimulus that was injected in the economy, creating a surge in demand, um, essentially from goods to services as people you know, moved out of lockdown, um, this creates this a tight labor market. And the consequences is the, are uh, wage inflation, which is something we're seeing quite uh, aggressively in the US. And this is why core inflation is now more sustained. It's sort of reaching escape velocity, if you will, while headline inflation has been rolling over if, because you know the oil prices is down 20, 30% from its peak. You have industrial commodities down 20, 30% year to date because of the Chinese uh, zero COVID policies, etc. So what we need is essentially tight, uh, higher rates for longer, uh, lower profit margins, unemployment to start picking up. Um, and last but not least, and this is where it gets quite complicated, is that governments are also being tempted to increase uh, fiscal policies to protect the cost of protect lower income households from the cost of living crisis, which makes the job of central banks even more uh, complicated. So ultimately, we might have to reach a level of interest rates that is going to be higher than what it would otherwise have been. So, so it sounds like there is this. this... I mean, when we're talking about the catalyst, because it sounds like it's the employment story that needs to change dramatically, i.e. worsen dramatically. But it sounds like from what you're saying is, is that the, the sort of commodity inflation has sort of ended or at least is now on the back foot. But it's wage inflation that's the concern. That takes a long time to, to kind of work through because all the wage negotiations are only just starting in the US. They're kind of coming through now. But it sounds like is, is that going to be the catalyst is that wages eventually start going up, which means either margins compress or corporates start letting go workers. And that's where you start to get the unemployment picking up. Is that the sort of thing that we need to see in order for the unemployment scenario to deteriorate to the sort of level we normally see when you get lows in the equity market? Yes, absolutely. But I think this is, it's a bit like the physics, uh, in physics you have Newton's third law of motion. So be behind every action, there's a similar reaction and opposite reaction. So as you see uh, labor cost increase, which is roughly two thirds of, of the input cost for companies in, in the service industry, which is the majority of, I mean, the most, uh, uh, abundant sectors in developed countries. Um, it will depend on the ability of these companies to pass these uh, higher input costs. Um, and if demand starts to fall, then this ability gets diminished and then profit margin gets hit. And over time, if demand s slows down enough, then they'll have to reduce their, their labor force. Um, but what's interesting is two things. Number one, it takes three to four quarters for every rate hike to have an impact on the economy. Uh, so it means that you know, the interest rate mechanism is, has a sort of a slow process to, to impact the economy, uh, particularly now that corporate balance sheets is, are relatively healthy. They're not over levered if you look at large cap as they were in the prior previous crisis. Consumer balance sheets are healthier than where they were in, in the subprime crisis, for example. So you will need, uh, again, higher rates for longer for, for its effect to, to start to, to, to bite. Um, and I think Ultimately, the central banks are no longer uh, providing protection or puts to, to, the, to the market. They're effectively no longer the friend of risk assets. And their job is to do whatever it takes to uh, sort of cure this inflation virus from, from the system. And, and that will essentially mean uh, lower highs and uh, lower lows in, in equity uh, prices going forward. So kind of interestingly in that, in, in terms of that, I guess the all important thing for investors is that is the timing and the sequencing because we're all impatient. You can feel it now. Everyone wants the lows to come right here, right now. But it sounds like this is going to take quite a while to play out. I mean, you know, it sounds like we're talking 2023 at the earliest and maybe longer because, as you say, three, two to three quarters for interest rates to work through. Presumably, 
a couple more quarters maybe for um, corporates to really kind of change their employment outlook and employment situation. So in terms of, of me as an investor thinking, are you sort of, sounds like the real lows in the equity market are probably still somewhere ahead of us yet. Uh, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you see that um, with when the equity markets or investors thought that the, the Fed would pivot, uh, as they did in 2018, uh, in the middle of 2022, that was the July-August rally. You saw the S&P rally by, close, uh, by almost 20 percent. And just for the central banks to, to sort of, uh, and Chairman uh, Jay Powell, to reiterate the message that we're nowhere near done when it comes to, to fighting inflation, uh, and then you know the the rally literally uh, disappeared uh, over the over the following few weeks, um, and I think we'll have we'll have this sort of cognitive dissonance between the time of markets and their ability to discount future events and the time it takes for the underlying economy to recover. Um, I was making a joke with a friend saying that it's as if, uh, if you look at the past few months, the equity market priced a recession and a recovery before the global economy had time to go in the, in the recession in the first place. Um, so that creates a volatility and uncertainty. And I think the conclusion here, in the same way as we, uh, there was this adage that's, that said, you should not fight central bank, um, in, in sort of in their ability to to fight uh, deflationary forces. Similarly, you shouldn't fight central banks in their uh, sort of conviction and commitment uh, to fight uh, high inflation. And the positive news, however, is we need to monitor core inflation. So when we see signs of sort of continued and sustained drop in core inflation, then it will signal to the market that central banks will be close to their pivot. And that will probably be Q3, Q4 of next year, uh, hopefully. I mean, obviously things can, can, can change. Uh, and then you, I think the equity market will start to, to recover and, and find a, a bottom. So, so just to finalize here then, in terms of thinking about this, it sounds like because it'll take a long time, rather than the sort of what, we, what we're used to in 2018 and then the exogenous shock of 2020, when everything correlated to one in a short space of time and bounds, this will be, as you say, a slow motion car crash, but presumably in that there will be lots of rotation. So it won't just be all equities down. It'll be some down, but others up. And there'll be lots of trading opportunities as it'll be three steps down, two steps up over this extended period. So it actually will be for the opportunistic outlook, quite a lot of ways to potentially profit from this type of environment. Yes, it will be clearly a trading environment. So, you know, sectors like, you know, stocks that benefit from the green transition, uh, where you'll see a significant amount of capex will essentially be more resilient than the overall market. So think about the European Green Deal, Repower EU or the Biden plan uh, and think about the sectors that will see all that uh, fiscal stimulus and, and demand. So this is money that uh, these companies will, will, will monetize. And on the, at the other end of the spectrum, if you look at retail, exposed sectors are already down 30 to 35 percent and some of them particularly if they have leveraged balance sheet will have an issue uh, refinancing this these debts and and that's where you could see more default on the high yield and equities will will take a, a pretty significant hit um, that being said i think there's a quote that says there's always light at the end of the tunnel but just make sure it's not an oncoming train uh, and in that context um you know, having tactical and trading positions and, and essentially being agile in the way you um, uh, look at your portfolio is going to be uh, very important over the next few months. Well, brilliant. That's very clear. Thank you very much, Koki, for that. And um, because it's going to be taking a while to play out, it'd, it'd be great to, to get you back on over this sort of 12 to 18 month period as this unravels to see where we are and what signposts we can be looking at. But thank you very, very much, much for your pleasure. time. Thank you, Roger.